Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Maria Tranquilli, and I'm a program manager at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. For those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potentials and grow. We will open up for live Q&A at the end of this event, so please submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. And none of this None of what we do could be possible without the amazing support from our sponsors. We are very humbled by their contributions. During these unique times, we are curious about sentiment and how you are feeling as entrepreneurs within our community. So we would like to start by taking two different polls to understand how you're feeling at the moment. First poll, how are you feeling? Let us know. Are you feeling fearful, anxious? Are you surviving? Are you optimistic at this moment? We would love to hear from you. Perfect, thank you all. Share the results here. Lots of people feeling anxious right now. It looks like also surviving and optimistic are runners up. And our second poll, what is keeping you up at night? Is it finance or sales or marketing? Is it scaling, pivoting your team or surviving at the moment? Please let us know. Wonderful, thank you all for sharing your answers. Right now, sales and surviving are actually tied. So interesting. Well, I feel like this is the perfect, um, perfect event for understanding both of those things, especially sales and I would say marketing. Without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Temi, who is the founder and CEO of Pembroke PR. Temi, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Temi. Hi. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. I'm definitely delighted to be here and to meet all of you. So the question is, what is PR? So I'm gonna share my screen with you so I can walk you through a slideshow I've put together about this. So just uh, bear with me a second while I get this up. Okay, here we go. Here we go. So now I'll just make this full screen. Um, okay. Okay, just making it to the screen. Right, that's gonna work for now, people, okay? Um, right, so my name's Temi. Um, you can email me any questions you have when we're done with the presentation at temi at pembrokepr.com. Um, you can also find my company on Instagram at pembroke underscore PR. You can find my personal Instagram account at Tiger Temi. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Okay, so the first question, what is PR? This is a fun little graphic um, I like to share with people about the basics of PR. So you've got marketing. So usually there's a lot of confusion about what PR actually is. So we have marketing, which is basically telling people what you do. You have public relations, which is giving people an opinion about what you do. And then you have advertising, which is repetitive impressions of what you do. And then you have branding, which explains what you do. And this is a fun little infographic that usually helps people remember that in quite a clear way. So one of the most fundamental things about PR is the power of persuasion. Great storytelling is the art of persuasion. And when it comes to persuasion, brevity is key. Why? Attention. People just don't pay enough attention. So you've got to keep it short and sweet. It's a way of letting people know who you are, what you're doing, and why they should choose you. 
So a key part of PR is storytelling. So if we move on to storytelling here, you can see a few key words that are very important when it comes to how you choose to tell the story of your brand. So it's always a good idea to share some history to figure out the key words that you want to use to describe your brand, how you're gonna build trust. Stories are really useful in a way to build trust with potential customers, existing customers. Um, stories are also a great way to help your brand stay in people's memory. And then still a great way to convey experience, the experience people have with your brand, with your company, with your service, with your product. One of the really important things to think about when you're trying to figure out the story you want to tell of your brand is engagement happens when emotions are evoked. So how do you want people to feel when they hear the story of your brand? Uh, relevance is also really important. Why is what you're doing relevant to the reader? And something I love to help people figure out is how to find your magic slice. So it's that special place where the stories you want to share are the stories your audience wants to hear. Great PR is about connecting your story with your target audience in a way that generates reaction and leaves a lasting impression. The power of storytelling is just a way to convey what you do, evoke emotion, and especially for the tech founders that we have in the audience, if it's too technical, it's not interesting. If it's too broad, there's no value. This is a great way to describe the benefits of PR for people. So we have four diamond rings here, five diamond rings here, and they all look exactly the same to the naked eye. Fun fact, I'm actually diamond trained, so I can actually grade diamonds. So if I was to grade any of these diamonds, they'd all get exactly the same grading, they're one carat, G color, VBS, S1, Clarity, they're all in a platinum setting. So you'd think they'd be the same price. And this is where the difference in PR has to your brand and your positioning. So you think about the four key moments of your business history, differentiation. So first of all, background. Why did you start your company? What was the problem that you were solving? Beginning, how did you get started? What was your spark of insight that led you to start your company? Process, how do you do things differently from the other companies that are doing what you're doing? And product, what does your company do that no one else can? And I actually feel the diamond rings are an excellent example of this because the next slide is gonna have all the prices on. So I want everyone to have a really good look at these five rings. And then the next slide, we have the brand names and the prices. Quite a difference as I think you can see. Um, so we've got quite a range of price. And um, for people that are familiar with diamonds, all the different brands definitely have a very different ideology behind them. If you went to Harry Winston, you'd fully expect all the bells and whistles. You'd fully expect to get taken to a private room at the back to get champagne, to have an expert like falling over you. And that would be a huge part of your experience. And the experience part of buying the ring would be a very important part of the story for you as a person choosing that particular ring. If you didn't necessarily want the full experience, then you could opt to do it online, either on Brilliant Earth or Blue Nile. And it's a very different experience, but you know you're still getting the ring that you want. You're just not necessarily getting the full service experience, which is a huge part of what you pay for with the brands like Harry Winston and Tiffany. In a world where people have a lot of choices, the story is often the deciding factor. What matters? Is it the ring? Is it the experience? Is it the story? What do you want your story to be? And in the context of thinking about what you're doing, what do you offer? A short description of the market that you're addressing. To whom do you offer this? Your customers need to be at the front and center of your story. Why are you different? And I think um, when we look at these rings, you can see how that really plays out for people. It's also a great example of proof of the power of perception. They're pretty much identical rings, but the difference is the power of positioning and the resulting perception, because we think of these brands really differently. We also expect different prices, even though we know it's exactly the same thing. And another key thing here is the power of earned media. So 92% of people trust earned media and media is known to be the most trusted form of advertising that there is. So when your customers become your channel, bloggers, social media, press, they speak about your brand on your behalf. And that drives traffic, engagement and sentiment around a brand. So um, a little bit about the work that I do with PR. I do uh, luxury lifestyle PR. I've been running my agency for about seven years now. I started out in-house in San Francisco for a restaurant group called Flower and Water 
well, the restaurant group is called the Natimius Group. The first restaurant was Flan Water, then we opened Central Kitchen, Slew Maria, and Trick Dog. So I've learned a lot over the years about how to produce a great shoot, what we need in terms of great photography, which is key for any product or service. To be honest, you need to be able to have the great photography to help convey that message, to make it a more engaging story. It tends to be quite tough for people to read a story. A photo tells a thousand words. Um, so this next slide, this was a sheet that I produced when Central Kitchen opened. And this was a really interesting day. So it was the opening day. We had lots of different photographers coming through. I had lots of different publications that needed photos. And this particular photographer, Aubrey Prick, who's now become a great friend of mine, was just starting out at the time. I knew I needed a great photo of the full space. This is called a hero shot when it's a full space and just really conveys a strong idea of what the space is going to look and feel like when you come in. I knew I needed a hero shot. We didn't have our own photographers in the mix that day. So it will be took this great photo, she let me use it. And in exchange for me using this photo as my main photo to pitch to all the different publications. And for her, it benefited her because she got to have her name associated with a great photo in all these different publications. But again, just to emphasize the importance of great photography, especially if your business has a physical space or if your business has a specific product, you definitely need to invest in great photography. And the thing to really keep in mind with great photography is you need editorial quality images. So if you are a brand that's making clocks, for example, have a look at images of clocks that are getting the type of coverage that you would want to get for your brand. Have a look at how they situate the clocks like you know are they in a bedroom are they in a kitchen they just have a really good think about how you want to convey think about the use how you want people to use your product and think about how that can come together in a great photo to really convey the emotion behind what you're trying to create with your brand and your product so the next slide this is one of my existing clients Reagan Baker Design she's an interior designer in the Bay Area and what we do is we came up with a few keywords that we want to make sure we use at every single touch point of interaction for the clients, existing clients, potential clients, and also within the company. So I think this is a great exercise for every single company to do, come up with a handful. I usually recommend five, it depends on the size of your company, but come up with about five keywords that you want to describe your brand, your company, and make sure they're reflected at every single touch point. Make sure they're reflected in the language that you use about your brand. Make sure they're reflected in the images that you have for your brand. Consistency is key. So the other thing that I recommend people do quite early on when you're thinking about the keywords, when you're focusing on consistency, think about four different things. You want to have the single sentence to describe your brand. You want to have your elevator pitch, which shouldn't be any longer than three sentences. You want to have the 250 word description of your brand. And then you want to have the 500 word story. Okay, so if we move on to the next company. So this is where I used to work, Flower and Water. These are key words that are reflective of every single touch point. It's reflective in the imagery, it's reflective in hear about the brand and it's very important for the team. These are words that just are reflected at every single touch point. And I sound repetitive, but that's because that's what you need to do to get that consistency. So when you go into Flan Water, you get the feeling of it being local, it's authentic, it's fresh, it's amazing quality. The craftsmanship that goes into preparing every single meal, everything is prepared by hand. They've got deep roots, they've got um, connections to the farming communities. Their main chef, Tom, learned how to make all the different like regional types of pasta when he went out to train in Italy. It's part of the community, it's for the community, it's very community based. When they opened in that particular location in the mission, there was nothing there. So people came in, but they really fostered strong relationships with their existing community. It's original, the different combinations they do. I'd never seen bone marrow on a pizza before. And I think a lot of people felt that way, which is why that became so popular so quickly. And at the same time, for such a high octane service, you'd expect it to feel formal, but it's also really relaxed, which is something that I think just makes it really inviting and definitely makes it feel much more community focused. The next one I have is Trip Dog. This was a fun opening and a lot of similar words are part of the same group. Again, local, very strong focus on the craft. If you've ever been in there or whenever you do go in there, 
you will see a level of skill and dexterity with the mixologists where every time they mix a drink they have really unusual combinations and it's watching an art form when they mix the drinks and that's a huge part of what they wanted to do with the brand um, it's very experimental again going back to the different combinations that you don't necessarily find in other bars which is a great thing to keep people coming back and um, they also do a fun thing where they change their men uh, they change their menu twice a year i think it is might be wrong but i think it's twice a year and they just reference different things like a chinese takeout menu or an old record or a boarding pass they've referenced so many different things and they've also garnered a lot of attention by coming up with these really original experimental menu cocktail menus that most people have never seen anything like before again quality again community again relax because these are all really important things to the founders of the company when they set out this is what they wanted to do and they've managed to achieve it and it stayed consistent Another fun one, Humphrey Slocum, a lot of food companies, so I did start out my career in San Francisco in food. Humphrey Slocum, they're a fun company. They uh, describe themselves as ice cream with attitude. <laughs> and um, I think definitely have a look at their Instagram if you want to get a sense of what kind of attitude they want to convey. It's um, usually a mix of unexpected, sophisticated, chef-driven combinations to create the flavors that they have. They're decidedly adult, and one of their best-selling flavors is called the Secret Breakfast, which has uh, cornflakes and it's laced with bourbon, so definitely not for kids, but obviously kids are going to buy ice cream because they're kids. Um, so a huge part of what they have for their keywords, attitude, humor, fun, inventive through the unexpected combinations, sustainable in terms of where they source the different food items from, quality again, you can taste the difference, literally. <laughs> it's fresh and it's original. Uh, another food company the reason i chose to focus on the food companies because everybody eats everybody can connect with food on a very significant emotional level whether you love it or hate it everyone has that connection with food so i just felt um from the pre-registration there's quite a range of different industries but i felt at least food is common ground for everyone um, so this is another local company, Charles Chocolates, based in San Francisco. So they're small batch, handmade, all natural. And again, that emphasis on quality. And when you go into their factory, when you buy their chocolate, I feel those are four key words that you feel at every single touch point from their packaging to the product, to the combination, to going into their bakery and their cafe. You just definitely feel those things at every single touch point. And that's, again, just the emphasis on consistency because it just creates a really strong emotion again going back to evoking emotion to create engagement to create lasting memories as a core part of your story that's what people need that's what works when you think about the brands that you remember when you think about the brands that you love chances are you tend to use the same words to describe them time and time again and chances are those could well be the keywords the brand decided they wanted you to feel every time you experience their product every time you experience their space every time you experience their service so I'll just move through the rest of the slides and I'll just, um, these are just a selection of different projects that I worked on. And again, they just highlight the power of images to convey a particular emotion. This was a YouTube series done with Mark Bittman in partnership with the University of California. He came out to Cali, he's a New York Times food writer. He's a author. He's been on the food scene for a really long time in the context of America. And he wanted to produce this show, which was really interesting. And it was a six part series and every episode, he did a deep dive research into a different element of the food chain in California. So I think when you see this image, you can see he looks like he's discovering, he looks like he's exploring, he looks like he's deep in thoughts. And when you actually watch the show, those are all key words that we want to did a deep dive into weeds edible weeds i hadn't really heard much about edible weeds before so for me it was definitely fascinating majority of people that watched it hadn't heard much about edible weeds before like weeds that grow in the sidewalk um not necessarily recommended you try and eat those today but it was a fun thing to explore with him it was a fun discovery process and it was also very informative the keywords that we mentioned this one goes back to central kitchen and this is a photo of the chefs in action. So you can see a strong attention to detail, precision, craft, skilled, community, all reflected in this image. It's an open kitchen. When you go into the restaurant, it's an open kitchen. So you see this happening when you're sitting in the dining room, which again, creates a really interactive experience with people, creates that engagement. No matter how you feel about it, you're gonna have some emotion be evoked. And again, that's what helps something be more memorable. This was a 
fun shoot that I did in partnership with KQED, Jacques Pepin, um, his final TV series um, that he filmed at KQED Studios in San Francisco. I mean, I just have to say, I've never seen anyone with a much, with a more impressive work ethic. We were filming four episodes a day and he was 79 at the time. Each episode is 30 minutes. It'd take about an hour to tape an episode. He almost never missed a cue. He always knew how to look at the right cameras. His knife skills were phenomenal. So again, you know, what are the key words that we want you to feel when you're watching Jacques' show, the experience? He's a French chef. He's got so much experience. He used to have a show with Julia Childs. Um, so the authenticity, the originality, the perfection of a craft, his life skills are known for being legendary. When you watch him, you see that because it is legendary. Um, to see someone that can do what he can do with a knife as quickly as he can do it without cutting anything apart from the very specific thing that he's trying to cut. Um, so that was definitely a really engaging experience. And I think, again, like this is why cooking shows are so popular with people because they evoke a very strong emotion. They draw you in. They're all slightly different in terms of the emotion that they want to invoke in you. But um, it's something that I think cooking shows do really well because it's visual, it's motion, and it's food. And that's what I mentioned earlier on. Food is a common denominating factor for everybody because we've all got to eat. This was a shoot that I did with an interior designer. And this ended up being the hero shot of the house. It was a big house, several different rooms. But um, we knew we wanted to convey a Mediterranean ideology with this particular house. So in terms of use of the color, the layout, the feeling of space, um, the Moorish influence with the tiles. There's a lot of Mediterra Mediterranean theme and color in the house, but we felt this one was most reflective of all kitchens coming back to food. Everybody loves to see a good kitchen, an interesting kitchen. Kitchens are known for being the heart of the home. There's a reason for that. And this, it takes a lot of time and effort to produce the shoot. So for example, with an interior design shoot, usually I'll do a walkthrough with a designer before and we'll take pictures on our iPhone because photos, professional photos, tend to look very different to the naked eye to how they look when you get a photo. So really good, happy medium to test it out and to just utilize your time effectively to take some iPhone shots because there'll be things that you notice in an iPhone shot that the naked eye wouldn't notice and it'll help you reposition things before you get the professional in, which saves a lot of time when you have the professional shoot, also ultimately saves a lot of money, which is very important for early stage. From the pre-registration information, I can see that most of you are early stage, which is great that you're thinking about this so early on, but those are definitely things that you need to keep in mind with how you want to bring your brand story together. So I know bootstrapping was a very important question for a lot of people, so I'll definitely touch on that. I think two key things to keep in mind for bootstrapping, brevity, got to keep it short. Nobody, do not assume anybody has a lot of time to listen to the new thing that you're talking about, because until they know why it's interesting, it's not necessarily that relevant to them. So that's my second word. So brevity is the first one, keep it short. Second word, make sure it's relevant. When you're speaking to people about your brand, make sure you're focusing on the things that make it relevant to them. So I know for some of the more tech companies, especially if you're B2B, then it's harder to kind of have that conversation with your friends because they're not necessarily your market, which is totally fine. But you can also have those early conversations with your friends and family to make sure you're explaining what you're doing in a way that is simple and accessible. Because quite often, if you're too technical in your description, you need to do a little bit more work to make it more accessible for a broader audience, which is what's going to make it interesting. Um, timing is another key thing. So when you think about reaching out to different um, people in media, bloggers, journalists, social media influencers, depending on what form is the best form for you to reach your potential audience, timing is key. So think about the seasonal nature of life. You know, we've got the four seasons, not so much in San Francisco, but in general, the world, you know, a lot of places operate on a four season structure. So you've got to think about that in terms of timing. When is the best time for people to find out about your product, your service? And then think about when would be the best time to reach out to key media. So in general, media work about three months out, which is quite a long time, but it's very important to know that ahead of time. So for example, if you've got a product that you think be great to launch at Christmas, you need to be having those conversations with media now. Um, so at least that way, because don't assume the first time you reach out to someone about your product or your service, they're gonna want to take it on straight away. So you need to spend that time nurturing the relationship, explaining, you know, the initial point of contact should definitely be short and sweet. So the first time you reach out to someone, you know, keep brevity and relevance and mind, keep it really short. 
keep in mind that the average journalist gets about 200 pictures a day. So what's going to make yours interesting? What's going to make yours stand out? If it's too long, they're probably not going to read it. <laughs> if it's got too many attachments, they're not going to open them. If it's got more than one link, they're probably not going to click them. So just keep those things in mind when you reach out because it does make a difference. And then also in terms of relevance, make sure you are reaching out to the right person. So for example, if you have a food product, don't reach out to someone that covers sports because there's just no relevance. And then in their head, they're going to think of you as a time waster. So if you try and email them again, they'll be like, oh my gosh, you wasted my time. Um, so that's definitely something to think about. Um, PR is definitely a long game. There aren't really any shortcuts. It's about nurturing relationships. It's about building trust. It's about earning trust. It's about communication and how you choose to tell the story of your brand. That's not a quick thing. So it is definitely an investment for people to take on when they're ready for it. But that's not to say that you shouldn't try and do some of the basic things yourself to just help build awareness for the brand or the service or the product that you're building. Um, and then also to keep in mind that the media are also always looking for good stories. So they also need to constantly be discovering new services, new brands to find out what people are doing and to find out about new things so they can share these new things with their audience for their publication. So they're always looking for new stories. So it's not to discourage you from reaching out to media because I definitely think you should, but just make sure you spend that time making sure you've read the publication that you want to be in. So for example, if you want to be in Wall Street Journal, if you want to talk about real estate, make sure you spend some quality time reading the real estate section, find the people that write about the real estate that's most similar to what you want to be talking about. And just spend a bit of time researching that particular writer, look them up on Twitter, look them up on Instagram, find out what they're into, reference that very briefly in your initial point of contact. But those are all things that really help build relationships. And then when it comes to reaching out to influencers, which I know some people might need to do depending on what type of product or service they have, I'd recommend starting with the smaller influencers and seeing if you can offer some kind of trade. Like, you know, if you've got a product, ask them if they'd be willing to, you know, uh, talk about your product in exchange for some free product. Um, again, this is where relevance is key because there's no point reaching out to someone that talks about baby stuff. If you're trying to market a sports thing, it's just not necessarily going to be a good fit. You know, find the sports people that talk about the sports, the things, the more niche, the better, because the more interested they're going to be in what you're talking about, relevance again. And then the initial um, communication should definitely be kept brief. And I strongly recommend, and this is something that we do with all the clients that we work with to tailor your approach. So definitely always tailor your approach for the different publication that you're working on, tailor your approach for the different writer that you're reaching out to and just keep those key things in mind. So you need to focus on relevance, you need to focus on brevity and you need to focus on a tailored approach. Those are the things that consistently work well. Consistency being another thing that you need to do when you're thinking about the language that you want to use to describe your brand, your product, your service. Um, I'll just move along to the last two slides. So this was a really fun shoot that we produced. This was a playroom. <laughs> now, especially in the time of coronavirus, it's the ultimate kids playroom. Um, but again, there's a strong sense of symmetry. So we spent a lot of time prepping this and um, this is a Reagan Baker designed room and her team spent a lot of time prepping it, taking multiple iPhone shots to make sure it lined up the way we wanted it to line up to make sure we had the right colors. I think it was actually about eight different colors and we settled on these four because they just photographed really well. So we went with the pink and the purple and the blue and the green, but I think there was definitely a few more colors in the mix. And then how to lay out the peg pegboard on the right and then how to um, arrange the images on the left. So it's that thing, like you see a beautiful image, but there's so much time, effort and prep that goes into the creation of that image, which is a very important thing because that's what conveys emotion. That's what creates that engagement. That's what makes it memorable. And it helps really just communicate the story of who your brand is, what your brand does and how I know she's a little controversial right now, but this is still one of my favorite all-time quotes. And I think especially for a community of entrepreneurs, this is a really relevant quote. So this is what I wanted to wrap up with for you all. Um, that failing is just inevitable. And I think don't be afraid. I mean, you're entrepreneurs, so hopefully you're not afraid to fail, but um, it's just part of the process. It's part of every process, you know, for every no, um, for every 20 no's, there'll be one yes. And you never know what the 20th response is going to be until you make that request. So don't get put off. Bear in mind, especially now, 
um, writers, journalists, bloggers, social media influencers are all overworked. Um, so it might take a while for people to come back to you. They might not get back to you. Um, definitely feel comfortable following up with people, but just keep trying. I think that's the uh, one thing that I've learned consistently. The businesses that ultimately tend to do the best are the businesses that are run by people that just don't give up. So that's uh, where I'll wrap up my slideshow. Tammy, thank you so, so much. So much information. Oh my goodness. And we have lots and lots of questions streaming in. Are you ready? Would you like to take some questions? Absolutely. I can see lots of questions. 62. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, here we go. Oh my goodness. Okay. Let's start. And I will put some of these questions, compile them together because there are some that overlap. So um, let's see what we can do. And again, everyone listening in, thank you so much for submitting your questions. Please take some time, fill out um, in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen or ask in the chat and we would be so happy to get those answered. Um, and also, I think on our end, Olivia, our amazing uh, manager here at NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center will in the chat list a, or I'm sorry, share a link to a survey so Temi can actually hear your feedback and NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center can hear your feedback as well about the specific training and future trainings. So with that said, Temi, let's get started. We have some great questions here. Okay. Temi, in your experience, what have been some of the most effective strategies for de developing relationships with specific, for, with specific press for my startup? Okay, so um, I touched on this when I talked through the slideshow, but I think it's really important to figure out who is the right person for you to speak to. That's the most important thing you can do. It saves everyone a lot of time and energy, especially yourself, because you're bound to get a much more favorable response if you make sure you reach out to the right person. So for example, if you have a pen company, you want to look up competitive pen companies, find out who's written about them, find that person, look them up on Twitter, look them up on Instagram, find out what they're interested in, find out the type of stories they write about pen companies and think about how you can position your story for that particular writer in a way that makes it relevant to the writer, in a way that makes it relevant to their publication. And uh, remember to keep it brief. They haven't got a lot of time to read your story the first time. Once they're interested, then you can definitely get into a lengthy story with them. But that's why it's really important to figure out your keywords. So that way you've got the you know, you've got your keywords, you've got your elevator pitch, which is three sentences, which is pretty much the basis of the pitch in an email, because you do want to keep it short. And then once they express interest, then you can go into like the longer form story, the history and everything like that. Excellent, Tammy. Thank you. Relevance, brevity. I was hearing all of those things as you were sharing earlier. Amazing. Okay. Let's see, um, we have a lot of questions about, you know, what would the five top tips be, tactics or strategies for startups to take right now to minimize costs if they're not able to bring on someone um, that is a PR specialist at the moment? Um, okay, I don't know if it will be five, but I'll give you my general tips. So the first one is to do the keyword exercise. I definitely recommend that. I've definitely had people reach out to me thinking they're PR ready. I'm like, yeah, if you haven't got your keywords, you're not necessarily at that point because you need to know how you want to describe your brand to other people. Definitely a PR specialist can help you with that. But I think internally as a company, it's a really important thing that you've got that clear vision. So clarity is also really important. So I'd definitely say focus on internal clarity. And then um, photography. So I know photography isn't necessarily relevant to all companies. Um, I do a lot of work in the consumer space. So photography is paramount for the companies that I work with. But if you don't have the ability to use photography, then, you know, um, the focus on the story definitely becomes a lot stronger. What makes it interesting for people? People, you know, writers, readers have a short attention span. So there needs to be something that makes it really interesting and engaging for people. Photography makes it easier. But if you don't have the ability to have photography, you need to work a lot harder on your story. Um, I would definitely say when you are ready to reach out to PR companies, interview as many PR companies as you can get hold of, get personal references for PR companies and just start interviewing as many different people. What you want to focus on, you want someone that has experience in your field, save a lot of time and money <laughs> if they have experience in your field already, they've done it before, and you then want someone that's really good personality fit. So 
with whoever is looking after your PR. You're going to be having a lot of conversations with them about the nuts and bolts of your company. They need to be able to understand and help you refine your brand voice. They need to ideally get what your product is. If they don't understand what your product is, they can't explain it in a way that's engaging. So that's definitely really important. And as a company founder, there has to be that degree of connection because I definitely feel for me, I've definitely had interviews with brands and if there isn't that chemistry, if there isn't that connection in the first meeting, I'm like, yeah, it's probably not necessarily going to get that much better. So there's someone else that they could have that connection and chemistry with, so it's better for them. So as a company founder, I think, you know, when you interview lots of PR people, and maybe, you know, have a couple of interviews before you feel you're entirely ready just to get a sense. Um, but when you start interviewing people, you will find that you will have a stronger connection with someone than with someone else. So in terms of how to engage with PR people, there's several different ways you can do it. You can try and find an independent contractor, which would be less expensive for you. You can go with a boutique agency, which tends to be on the smaller side, around five people, that's where we are. Or you can go with like a full service, large scale international firm. And that's great if you're really well funded and you've got lots of <laughs> money to burn and you want to hit the world with your product. Fantastic. Oh my gosh, you hit on so many different answers actually to a few of these questions. <laughs> so let's see. We have a few questions around um, at what point is a startup company ready to engage a PR firm? What milestones should the startup have reached before it makes sense to bring in PR? And when it does make sense to bring in PR, how much should I be spending? Okay, uh, that's a great question. Several different questions, all great questions. on what your goal is. Everyone's goal is different. So for example, um, I just recently took on a client that's a, in the tech space. They're very well funded. And for them, they're looking at PR as a way to raise their profile, to raise more money. So I think that's a really significant thing. That can be a really helpful thing. I don't necessarily think you want to engage in PR just because of the cost of it. I don't necessarily think you want to engage in PR really, really early before you raise any money for the companies that do want to raise money because it can be expensive and it does take a while to see results. But I think if you're early stage and you want to start raising your profile to get more investors on board, that's a great time to engage in PR. We also see a lot of bigger companies engage in PR when they're getting ready to launch their IPO. Again, because you just need to really start building that awareness. So depending on what your particular company does, what your particular company does, the size of the company, your goals, you really need to focus on when you want to start bringing in the brand awareness. If you're a B2B company, the brand awareness is less relevant because you're speaking to a much smaller pool of people. Whereas if you're consumer facing, the brand awareness is very relevant because you're selling one product or several different products to lots of different people. So there are different, it's not, a, it's not the most specific answer because there isn't one answer. It really does vary from company to company. Um, and in terms of budget, and there's several different ways to look at the budget. So there's a marketing overall. So you've got marketing, you've got advertising, you've got PR. Again, whichever one, and you've got branding, which one is most relevant to you depends on your company. Um, and that's a difficult one. If I had specific examples, that might make it slightly easier for me to tailor my response. Again, going back to that thing of tailoring, because it is really important. And in terms of budget, how much to spend with a PR company, independent contracts that can go for about 200 to 250 an hour through to like full service international agency, which would be about 10 grand a month plus more, actually more. Thank you. Oh yes, very complex questions. That was fantastic. I know that answered quite a few different questions there. Wonderful. And for everyone still listening, please go ahead and submit your questions either in the chat or the Q&A function. We would love to hear from you. We have quite a few more. Okay, this is a bit of a long one. It's always been challenging to get an external PR marketing person to learn the essence of our business. It often shows when the contractor is asked to write copy as the content doesn't always capture the key points. How involved should the founders of the startup be in copywriting or in writing the copy? And how fast should the founders expect the contractor to come up to speed? Uh, great question. I would actually start by saying take a little bit more ownership there because you're saying in that particular situation the copywriter isn't getting your company. I would actually say maybe you're not explaining what you do well enough in a way that's accessible to that particular copywriter. They might not be the best copywriter for your field. So again, finding a copywriter with experience in your field is definitely really relevant. But it's also that thing just in terms of basic human communication. If somebody isn't understanding what you're explaining, maybe change the way you explain it. 
to make it more accessible. You know, maybe try it out with friends and family. If it's a frustrating process, try it out with friends and family and ask them what they're not understanding. Or you can even just ask the copywriter to be like, okay, this isn't really what I wanted. This isn't really what I was hoping for. Uh, what part are you having a hard time understanding? Do you not have experience in this field? If so, well, thank you very much for your time, but I'm gonna find someone that does have experience in this field. And then when you do find someone that has experience in your particular field, especially if it's technical, it's even more important to have someone that understands what you're talking about, but you have to be able to explain it in a really simple way. Um, there's a great saying in communications that if you can't explain something to a five, six year old, then you need to think about how you can simplify what you're describing because the best companies are the ones that have the most simple explanations where straight away you understand exactly what they're doing. So I'd say to that particular person, for anyone else that feels relevant to reassess how you're describing what you're doing. And that takes us back to the keyword exercise. Think about the keywords that you want to use to describe your company. Think about the essence of your company. What is it you're doing? Who is it you're serving? Why is it relevant? And why is it interesting? And think about those emotions that you want to invoke in people. And I'd say focus on those things. Thank you so much, Temi. All right, we have some questions about storytelling. And let's see, so I'm going to read two or three questions and I think that you'll be able to answer them all. So you've answered this, though you might be able to expand on it. How do you incorporate photography when your company is not photo friendly, i.e., for example, accounting? And should you still value great photos in this case to tell the story? And a follow up question to that is, can you speak more specifically about storytelling? Sure. OK, so those are two very different questions. So the photography element, I do do a lot like all my work is consumer products and services. So that is such a big part of what we do. So I have such a strong focus on photography. Um, but what I'd say for a company like accountancy, that's not necessarily um, particularly photogenic. <laughs> I don't know how you get a great photograph of um, accountancy. Also think about who your audience is, because then you're not necessarily going to be written about in a lifestyle publication, because those are the glossy magazines with beautiful images like Vanity Fair and, you know, the Wall Street Journal magazine and Vogue and Elle. That's not your audience. So think about who your audience is. So where do you read, you as the accountancy company founder, where do you read about your competitors? Think about how they're written about and think about how you can position your company in a similar way. Chances are it's much more B2B publications. Chances are it's much lighter on imagery. Chances are the companies that get the best coverage are the companies that can tell the best story. So for you, that would be a situation where you really need to focus on your story. And then in terms of doing a slightly deeper dive into storytelling, Think about the emotions that you want to have evoked when someone reads your story. When you think about the brands that you know and love, when you think about your favorite food brands, your favorite travel brands, your favorite hospitality brands, how do you feel every time you think about them? What are the keywords that come to mind when you experience any of those things? How do you want people to feel when they read about your company? the relevance, think about why what you're doing is relevant to the potential reader, and then finding your magic slice, that special space where the stories you want to share are what the audience wants to hear. And that's where tailoring your response is really key, because especially if you're doing something new, especially if you're doing it for the first time, the audience doesn't necessarily know they want to hear your story because they don't know your story exists. So you need to think about how you can tell your story in a way that is relevant to that particular audience what problem are you solving? Why is that problem best solved by you and your company? And think about how you can tell your story in a way that connects. I think the best way to do this, listen to the wonderful podcast by NPR, How I Built This. They are such great storytellers. They do a lot of prep <laughs> before they record a podcast. Because I think, you know, it's great that we all think, oh yeah, they just hop in the studio and they just talk and it's amazing. They do so much prep, so much prep. They've gone through so many prep sessions before they actually record the podcast to make sure they hit the key points. I do this with my clients as well, that we prep before they do any kind of speaking engagements to make sure they hit the key points of the story. We want to make sure they get to tell when they're on a platform. So that's something for you listen to people who are doing it really well already and figure out what makes their story engaging, the emotions, the relevance, and then the magic slice. I think those are the key points. And then in terms of how to craft your story, background, why did you start, beginning, how did you get started? What was your spark of insight process? How do you do things differently? Product, what does your company do that no one else can? Fantastic, again, a very complex question and lots of great, great feedback there. Um, we have a follow-up question from Patty. 
How about creating strong visuals that aren't photo based, such as infographics to tell the story of the accounting group? Would that be an example or something that you would suggest? Yes, it can definitely really work. I definitely would recommend if it's an infographic, you make it branded because um, as we've all seen time and time again, infographics can spread like wildfire and it can be like once it's been reposted like several times it'd be quite difficult to figure out who the original source was so if you're creating engaging content and that's the best way to think about an infographic it's engaging content um, make sure it's branded it doesn't have to be like obnoxiously branded it could be quite a small brand but just to make sure that you have the brand name there and again think about who your end consumer is what are they reading what do they like to read do they want to see a photo I don't know if I'm that interested in seeing an infographic from Tiffany. I'd want to see diamonds if they're going to show me an infographic because that's just what I expect to see from a diamond company. So just think really clearly about what your company is, who your competitors are. And the reason I keep mentioning competitors, it's a great way to assess how other people who are doing something similar or the same as what you're doing present themselves in a way that is ideally working if they're successful. Fantastic. Okay, let's see. We have a few questions around, oh, the keyword exercise that you had mentioned. Do these keywords need to be search engine optimized? Would that be a recommendation for you? No. Um, it depends again on the brand and the company and just, you know, your product, your service. It depends on how important that is. But um, I don't think they need to. I think the main thing that I love to see with brands is for that to be core in the language that you use internally to describe your brand and then when you engage in PR you use the same language externally to create that consistency of ideology with what's happening inside the company and how people perceive the company. Absolutely okay we have a question here from Cyrus. Hi Tammy great tip so far. Are there any PR conferences that you might recommend where we can find a large amount of journalists? That is an excellent question that I actually do not have an answer to. And I would recommend we trust our trusty friend Google with <laughs> that one. I don't have a great answer. It can be quite hard to find a large pool of journalists. It's also not necessarily the most effective way to find journalists. I would say another way of approaching the same situation would be the conventions or conferences for your particular type of product or industry going there there are always journalists there so if you have a travel product go to the travel conferences and there will always be journalists there if you're in hospitality go to a hospitality conference there will always be journalists there because they are always looking for a new story um, and they're always looking for new products new services that they too can speak about to their audience and their publications fantastic okay we have um I mean, actually, I see a gap in the market. If anybody wants to fill that gap and create some kind of conference for journalists to come to, I think that would actually suit a lot of people here. Um, okay, so we have a question. It's a little bit specific, but I have a feeling it may help many people. What might you recommend for a startup doing virtual online trainings in terms of graphics and pictures? Would you have any recommendations on how to decide what graphics or images um, that type of company might share? Or maybe a larger question, how do you actually determine the type of images to represent your, your business or your startup? Would it be based on those keywords? Um, I would say spend some time seeing what the com competition is doing or potential competition. So if, for example, you want to start a uh, entrepreneurship training program, have a look at what other entrepreneurship training programs are in existence, see what they do well, see what they don't do well. The more you discover, the more you'll find a gap. Um, when you think about the graphics that you put together, you want it to be reflective of your company, which is why the keyword exercise is really helpful and really important. You also want it to be engaging. So what is interesting for the end user? What is it about that particular graphic that's going to attract your attention? That's why I love sharing the infographic that explains the difference between branding, marketing, advertising, and PR, because it's really memorable. It's, it's a little cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> which makes it fun it creates an emotion it's engaging and I think depending on your company and your and your um, industry that's the type of thing that you want to focus on think about who the end user is think about what type of thing is going to engage them have a look at what your competition do well have a look at what your competition do badly and try and position yourself accordingly fantastic Tammy thank you um, everyone is saying thank you so much. They've had a really great time here. And, and to all still listening, again, um, as we mentioned earlier, if you'd like to connect in the spirit of PR, feel free to post your LinkedIn 
um, in the chat to connect with each other. I think this is a fantastic way to do that. Um, Temi, that was one of our last questions. So I would actually turn it over to you before we wrap up for today. Do you have any parting words of wisdom for our early stage startups, for our aspiring entrepreneurs, for our tech founders that are you know, bootstrapping and or putting things together on their own? What might you share as some final words? Um, do the research. I feel everyone does better when they read more. I mean, to be honest, in general, whatever you're doing in life, read more books. <laughs> That's like the most helpful thing I can say. Okay. Read more books. But um, specifically to entrepreneurs, just spend a lot of time doing the research. It will ultimately save you time because it will help you figure out how to be relevant. It'll help you focus on brevity through focusing on the key elements of your business that make it interesting, that make it different. Because the more you read about other companies, you definitely spend a lot of time reading about other companies, big companies, small companies, how they started, what worked, what didn't, read about why companies failed. And everything you read about, every company you learn about as a learning experience for you, I strongly recommend listening to NPR's podcast, How I Built This. If you're in hospitality, there's a great podcast called Hospitality Design. For female entrepreneurs, there's a great podcast called Second Shift that I really enjoy as well. And um, there's so many different podcasts. You know, definitely hop on iTunes and just have a look through the different podcasts depending on your industry. But just really spend the time learning. I think there's so much benefit from spending the time upfront learning more about your field. And that helps you just focus on the things that can be more relevant to more people because you'll start to feel very quickly the things about other people's story that feel relevant to you and how other people's storytelling evokes emotions in you. And that's going to help you figure out how to translate that into how you choose to speak about your company. So definitely spend the time researching whatever medium works best for you, books, magazine articles, newspaper articles, podcasts, um, films also great documentaries you know depending on what you do so many documentaries so you can do that too and then um just really figuring out your keywords and how to describe the company the more you describe your company the better you get the better you get at brevity the more you describe your company as well so just keep telling people about especially if you're very early stage nobody knows what you're doing until you tell them so you keep telling people about what you're doing and just really work on the storytelling Tammy, incredible incredible advice and expertise and wisdom Oh, I've learned so much during this time with you. So thank you. And I want to take a moment to just say from our community and from us, we are so grateful um, on behalf of everyone today for your presence and your knowledge. Um, everyone that is still listening, we would love for you to fill out that survey. Let Temi know what your feedback is. Let NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center know your feedback. We would love to host Temi again and other speakers that are true experts and in their field. So let us know who you would like to hear from. Um, and before we head off, um, we want to make sure to invite you to some upcoming webinars and upcoming events. This Thursday, I'm sorry, next Thursday, Innovative Marketing Tactics Through the Funding Cycle, and the following Tuesday, Funding Optionality with Bank of the West, one of our sponsors, and 1863 Ventures. We would absolutely love to have you at either of those. We have lots of upcoming trainings that are really fantastic for our entrepreneurial community. So again, Temi, thank you so much for joining us today. We are so grateful for your wisdom and expertise. And to everyone, have a wonderful, wonderful day, and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you for having me.